Good morning. Welcome to Walling Community Church. My name is David. I am the senior pastor here, and uh, we just finished Easter, and we were just so excited to have everyone here. And I thought, you know, how we should follow Easter is perhaps addressing some of the skeptics. You know, Easter makes a big, big claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And I think in order to kind of go along with everything else that's in the Bible, you really have to believe that occurrence, that Jesus was a man who lived on this earth, he was crucified, he died on a cross, he was put into a tomb, and then three days later he came out of that tomb and hundreds of people saw him for a period of you know, weeks until he ascended into heaven. The Bible makes a very large claim. And so, can you trust it? Can you trust the Bible? I mean, how does stories of seas parting and blind people seeing and lepers being cleansed and the lame walking and the dead coming back to life, how can all of that be true? The Bible is God's story about how he created us, how he loved us, how he dies for us, and then we have to wrestle with all of that and somehow come to the conclusion that it's true, right? That this is true. From the mid-1970s to about 1984, close to 40% of Americans considered the Bible to be the literal word of God. But that number has been declining. As of a few years ago, the most recent poll said that 26% of Americans view the Bible as a book of fables and legends, history and moral precepts that were recorded by people. In other words, myth, right? Mythology. The Bible has always been one of the most widely read books in history. It's one of the best-selling books in history. It's sold uh, over 40 million copies in a single year. And it is one of the most widely translated books. 90% of the world can read the Bible in their language. But what makes it reliable? What makes it true? What makes it the Word of God? And how do we know it's the Word of God? We have to answer those questions, don't we? When I scroll mindlessly through my TikTok feed, I am bombarded with people who are looking for answers, for proof, proof that God exists, proof that the Bible is true. They say evidence. I want evidence. Prove it to me, they say. And it used to be that the Bible had some weight, some merit, some respect. You could say, you want proof? Bam, there's the Bible, there's your proof. Mm, not so much anymore. Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. David, King David is our author here, and it's certain that when you read those words, you can tell. He loves the word of God. Plus, you see within that that there's devotion even, because he has all these words like perfect, reviving, sure, wise, right, pure, enlightening, enduring, and righteous. King David certainly thinks that what he's reading is the Word of God, right? I certainly wouldn't use any of those words to describe something, somebody written, like a poem or a, a, a work of fiction. Psalm 119 says, all of your commands can be trusted. So here the author says that everything in the Bible can be trusted because it comes from God. Time Magazine thought this was such an important question They've put it on their covers twice. Here's a cover that says, how true is the Bible? And another that says, is the Bible fact or fiction? So you see, these aren't just questions that agnostics or atheists have. The world asks these questions. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That phrase, breathed out by God, is the one word in the Greek that's uh, a compound word. It's made up of two words. So it's 
Theo, Neustos, okay? Theo means God, and pneuma means breath or spirit. So that means here the author is saying that the Bible is literally exhaled by God, breathed out by God. Now, think back to the very beginning of the Bible. Think about those first pages in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So what do we see God doing in this moment? Speaking, right? Exhaling. From his voice comes creation. And so Paul is writing to Timothy that much like how the world was created from the breath and spirit of God, so the word of God, the Bible, is created as well. But you and I both know that the Bible didn't just appear one day, completed and finished. God didn't breathe out a book, right? Not the same way he spoke the world into place. So how do we talk about the Bible coming together, being assembled, lasting throughout time, and a book that we can rely on. I mean, here we've just been quoting Bible verses to prove it's true. But is that the right way to argue, to use the Bible to prove the Bible? I mean, it's one thing for the Bible to say, it can be trusted, but how do I know? How do I know this is the Word of God? This could also be lies. This could also be mythology. What evidence is there that this book is more than just the writing of people? That is a valid, legitimate, important question that we need to ask and answer before we can start to study the Bible. So today I want to ask, can I trust the Bible? What is it? What is the Bible? Well, it's a collection of books and letters uh, written by over 40 authors, written over a period of 1,500 years. The word Bible comes from the Latin, Biblia, and the Greek, Biblos, both of of which mean book. It just means book. The word probably comes from the city of Biblos, which is in Lebanon. It was the Egyptian city that the Greeks first got their paper from. The Bible is written in three languages. First language it's written in, Hebrew, right? Most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And to understand ancient Hebrew, The Bible is our most primary resource. Our most profitable archaeological find was the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 1947. But before that, Hebrew was very difficult to translate. For instance, we know that Joseph had a special coat, but we have no idea what made it special. The word we translate as many colors, it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. And for all we know, it was a coat with long sleeves or a coat with embroidery, or a coat made of choice wool. We have no way of knowing. Hebrew is very hard to read. How would you like to decipher a language that has no vowels, no space between the words, and it reads from right to left? Second language the Bible is written in is Aramaic. That was the language of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persian empires, all of which conquered Israel. If you remember our stories of Daniel in the lion's den, this is where the Israelites began speaking this language, and it replaces Hebrew as their native tongue. However, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest known manuscripts or copies we had of the Bible were not in Hebrew. They were in Greek. Greek is the oldest of all European languages. It dates back 1,400 years before Jesus. The Bible is written in Koine Greek, which is what the Persian and Egyptian trade merchants spoke. The Bible is also broken down into two different sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is another word for covenant or agreement. The Old Testament has 39 books inspired to be written by God, written over a period of a thousand years. And we break the Old Testament down into five sections. The Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, the history books, that's 12 books, the poetry and wisdom books, five books, and the prophets, 17 books. The Hebrew Bible 
is called the Tanakh. It's the same books, but they break their books down into three sections. The Law, which they call the Torah, the Prophets, which they call the Nevi'im, and the Writings, the Ketuvim. One of the oldest copies of the Old Testament that we have today is called the Septuagint. This copy was written in the third century in Alexandria, Egypt. The legend says that King Ptolemy II wanted copies of every single book in his library, including the Hebrew scriptures. So he had 72 Jewish scribes translate their texts into Greek. The entire process supposedly took 72 days. And Septuagint is the Latin word for 70. Now this is typically where the question of an error would come up. There has to be scribal errors, right? They didn't have a photocopier back then. Surely somebody made a mistake. Well, they had rules to combat mistakes. The Hebrew scribes came up with a list of rules. I'm now I'm only going to give you just a few, okay? But these are the laws that they had to adhere to when they copied a text. The scroll had to be written on a clean animal parchment, which means no dots, no lines. Can you imagine if there was a dot already in the parchment? That could confuse the word, right? The pen had to be a feather from a clean bird. Before writing the name of God, the scribe would wipe his pen clean and say, I am writing the name of God, holy is his name. And once they began writing the name of God, they could not be distracted or stopped for any reason. Every skin had to contain a specific amount of columns equal throughout the entire book. Each column could not be less than 48 or more than 60 lines in length. The column width had to be exactly 30 letters. The space the size of a thread was to appear between each letter, and if letters touched each other, the entire manuscript was burned. If there was a tear or smudge in the document, it was burned. A space of three lines had to appear between each book, and no word could be copied from memory. Every word was copied letter for letter. After 30 days of completion, a second scribe had to come in and count the number of times each letter of the alphabet occurred in each book. And then compare it to the original. He also had to find the middle word on each page and make sure it was the same as the original. Oh, and by the way, the Old Testament has 304,805 letters, which makes up 79,976 words. In addition, any manuscript that was old, worn, torn was destroyed to preserve its integrity. That's why when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had very few, very few Hebrew manuscripts at that time. But in 1947, a young shepherd boy discovered a series of caves that contained clay pots, and inside that, the documents that we would later call the Dead Sea Scrolls wherein archaeologists and Bible scholars found 972 texts of Scripture. Before 1947, the oldest biblical manuscript we had was dated from 900 A.D. After 1947, the oldest biblical manuscript we had was from 125 B.C. Why is that significant? Well, for your friend or relative who insists that the Bible has changed like a giant game of telephone over time, and as it was rewritten and translated from language to language, from translation to translation, the answer to that is... Once the Dead Sea Scrolls were compared with the ones that we were using for biblical translation, we found them to be 95% identical documents that were a thousand years apart. They only had a 5% variation, and that variation was only in spelling style or punctuation and in no way changed the meaning of the text. That means that over the thousands of years the Bible has been spoken, carried, translated, and written, it has remained the same. And we have the copies to prove it. The books of the Old Testament are now called canon. Canon comes from the Greek word rule, or standard of measure. Now, during the time of Christ, we know they had copies of the Hebrew Scriptures. Our own Bible tells us that Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah. In fact, Jesus quotes 24 different Old Testament books. So who decided what would be in the Old Testament? Well, 
after Jesus, in the year 70, the Hebrew people found that their temple was destroyed by Rome. And thus, that also means that a lot of their sacred texts were lost. So in fear that the Bible would be lost, several rabbis founded a school of Jewish law in Joppa and began compiling a list of all the books that they should save. The list they came up with is the same list that we use as canon today. However, they would argue that they did not choose the canon, but rather they affirmed the books that were already the ones that were most widely used and read for their faith. What about the Apocrypha? I've heard that there's lots of books that Protestants don't use today, Jews don't use today. That's true. There are 16 apocryphal books that take place between 400 BC and the time of Jesus. Basically, it's the middle between the Old Testament and the New. So, when the Jews are affirming the canon in the year 70, those apocryphal books already existed. And so it was actually the Jews who rejected those books as scripture. They didn't include them in the Tanakh. The Protestants don't include them either. In fact, it's not even until 1546 that the Roman Catholic Church puts them in their Bibles. So we've only had the Apocrypha in Catholic Bibles in the last 500 years. So is the Apocrypha scripture? Well, it all depends on who you ask. Catholics will say yes. Protestants and Jews will say no. Why do we think the Jews didn't include them? Well, for one, those books are never quoted in the Old Testament or the New. We don't see these books quoted by Jesus. We don't see these books quoted by the early church. Plus, another crucial thing, none of the writers of the Apocrypha ever say these are the words of God. So they're just history. And what we end up seeing now is that the Bible is a very exclusive club. Not every book makes the cut. Every book has to be vetted by some pretty strict guidelines. And so in order for a book to become canon, how do you get your book into the Bible? Well, first we ask, is it authoritative? Meaning, is this the word of God? Second, is it prophetic? Means it has to be true. It has to speak true words of God. Third, is it authentic? Do we know who wrote it? Can we vet the author? We say we know who wrote it. Were th was this person an eyewitness? Four, is it dynamic? In other words, does this book enrich you? Does it change your life? And then lastly, was it received and collected and read by the early church? In other words, was this a book that people kept, copied, read, and preserved through history? I mean, come on, what makes a bestseller a bestseller? Today, what makes a, a book a bestseller? Word of mouth, right? People will say, oh, have you read this book? Right, popularity, you telling friends, and they buy a copy, they loan copies, people talk about the book over coffee, it gets made into a movie. This is what happens to the Bible. The books that people read and loved were copied and they were taught from. Consequently, the books that were not read, were not copied, that didn't change people's lives, they ended up not being trusted. It wasn't a big conspiracy. There was no ulterior motive. The books we have now are the same books the people have read and loved and preached from since 100 AD. Now, the New Testament contains 27 books. The New Testament is also broken down into three sections. The first four books are the Gospels, those are the lives of Jesus. Then we have the letters that were written to the church, to the people. And then we have Revelation, which is prophecy. Of the four Gospels, Mark was the first to be written, probably around 64 or 65. Why is that important? Well, because it all has to do with accuracy. If Jesus died around the year 30, and Mark was written within 30 years of Jesus' life, that means when Mark was being read, many people 
who had actually seen those events firsthand were still alive. Meaning, if there was any error or any mistake in that text, you could have easily said, no, that's not true. I was there. Which brings us back to reliability. Can I trust the Bible? Currently, right now in the world, it's estimated that we have 25,000 historical manuscripts around the world of the Bible. Now, how does that compare with other historical documents? Well, for instance, Homer's Iliad, we have 643 copies. And the oldest copy we have was written 400 years after Homer's death. 400 years after he died. So where, what's the proof? Where's the evidence that Homer actually wrote these words? If the oldest copy we have was written 400 years after he died, we have seven copies of the works of Plato. Seven. The oldest copy was written 1,300 years after his death. 1,300 years after his death. There's no way we can prove that Plato said those things. The earliest copies of the Bible we have, that means the oldest, right? They are fragments from the Gospel of John. They were written within 50 years of John's death. In fact, of the complete New Testament, we have 5,600 copies, and the time gap is only 225 years. Which means, when you use the accepted standard for evaluating the reliability of an ancient text, the Bible stands alone. There is no equal. No other historical document comes close. The New Testament canon. How did we get those books? How, does, how were those books put together? Again, authorship was crucial. Originally, the rule had to be that the book had to be written by an apostle or Paul, with the exception of Mark and Luke, since they were both uh, had the approval of the apostles. Now, of course, this led to a lot of other books supposedly written by biblical characters. There's the secret book of James. There's the Gospel of Thomas. There's the Apocalypse of Paul just to name a few. In fact, there were as many as 50 different Gospels in circulation when the New Testament was put together. However, much like the Old Testament, the New Testament canon came about simply by drawing on the books that Christians were using the most. So, as you can imagine, books that were not heavily used or taught, they were also not copied. But when a Roman official came to your house and they said, that they demand that you turn over any holy books that you might have. Which holy books are you going to surrender for them to burn? The books you love and cherish? No. You're going to hand over all those other books, <laughs> right? Later in 367, Athanasius of Alexandria, he authored the 39th Festal Letter, or the Easter Letter, which was to approve the Quintex Council, and in it, he listed the same 27 books of the New Testament that we use today in 367. In 382, the Pope asked his scribe, a man named Jerome, to transfer the four Gospels from Greek into Latin. Jerome worked on the project for two years, and then when the Pope died, Jerome continued his work, and he translated the entire Bible into Latin and it became known as the Latin Vulgate. This is where we get the word vulgar from. Vulgar just means common. And the books in the Vulgate, they are the same ones that we use today. Suffice it to say, the New Testament developed, evolved over the course of the first 250 to 300 years of Christian history, meaning there was no one person it was no one person who made the decision, nor was it a decision by a specific church or a specific council. And since it was a slowly forming process over the course of 300 years, there was also no agenda. 
When people talk about how the Bible was put together, they always list some, oh, there was an agenda. They were taking out books that did this, or they're taking out books that said that. There was a secret plan. There was a secret assembly. The particular writings that became the most widely used were the ones that were put in the New Testament and it evolved over time. Now, canonization also raises other questions. How do we know these people weighed all the facts? How do we know that they didn't accidentally throw away a document that was written by an important apostle and we never knew about it? All right, let me tell you a Bible story. (laughs) When Josiah was king of Judah, the people of God at that time were worshiping a lot of fake gods and they were doing a lot of strange things. But Josiah began to miss the way uh, the ancients did it. He started to miss the religion of his forefathers. And so he set out to seek the God of his ancestor, David. So Josiah ordered the destruction of all the pagan idols and all the pagan temples. And he started a, a new rebuilding project. Well, one day his high priest, a man named Hilkiah, was working to rebuild the temple and he came across an ancient scroll. He felt it was so important, he rushed to the king's chamber and Hilkiah and King Josiah had never seen this scroll before. They had never heard it read in their lifetime. So how were they able to recognize that this was an important document and that this was actually scripture, that this was actually the word of God? How? Well, because its words were the same words that they were taught as children. Second Chronicles says, and when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah saying, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our forefathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. You see, Josiah and Hilkiah recognized the scriptures as soon as they heard them. It's God's word. So it's recognized, right? And when people ask, well, what if the wrong books were left out? Or what if the wrong books were left in? That statement shows a complete lack of trust in God. Listen, God chose to reveal himself to us in his word. And this is the word we have. So, if this book isn't right, then people didn't get it wrong. God did. This book has to be right. Because, by default, it's the book we have. (laughs) Doesn't that make sense? Now, I've answered some questions this week. Uh, We'll answer some more next week. But for now, let me try to reassure some doubts, okay? You know, it's interesting. We spend hours learning uh, about God, and yet we don't devote the same time to learning about the books that we learn about God from. So let me give you some assurances. And the first is the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is sufficient. It means the Bible contains everything we need for salvation and knowledge of God. This book is doctrine. Its scripture is clear enough to make us accountable and to carry out any responsibilities we have. Second Timothy, we read earlier, says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Notice it says, so that you may be complete. Do you need to be more complete? No, you can't be extra complete, right? That means scripture is sufficient. Let me teach you a Latin phrase, sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is one of the five pillars of the Reformation, and it means by scripture alone. It was the battle cry that opposed any force that said, no, we need to add to the words of God. If somebody says, okay, great, you you read the Bible, you also need to read this. Just say no. (laughs) The institutions and other religions back then were trying to divert people to read other things. Said, there's more to Christianity than just the Bible. 
oh, you've only read the Bible? You need the rest of the story. Martin Luther said, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. And sadly, this is the doctrine of scripture that we forget the most. You know, we can say all the right things about the Bible and even read it every day, but when life gets difficult or when things get a little boring, we stray away and we look to new words and new revelations and new experiences to bring us closer to God. For some reason, we don't like that the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about heaven. <laughs> and so what do we do? Well, we flock to bookstores to read accounts of little children who claim to have been there. For some reason, we don't trust the Bible as historical. So what do we do? Then we turn to news anchors who've written books. It's amazing to me how many millions of people will read a work of fiction and never crack open the actual Bible. Are those things bad? Are those books bad? Well, here's the thing. You don't want to try to think about the Bible and then be confused as to whether you read it in the Bible or not. For instance, God helps those who help themselves. Not in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. When you read an outside source, sometimes our brain files that information at no fault of yours into the same exact folder. People who have studied these texts, people who are experts in the field, people who are smarter than you or me, <laughs> they have already removed the diamonds from the rocks and they have handed them to you. Paul tells Timothy that the Bible has everything you need to be complete. You have the articles of worth in your hands. Tell me, why then would you leave the diamonds and go back to the rocks? The Bible is sufficient and it is clear. That means the message of the Bible is easily understood. Did I just lose you? <laughs> You're like, what? Some of you are saying, no, 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 maybe to you, but not to me. When I read the Bible, it's very confusing. I agree, parts of the Bible can be confusing. We're just, you know, you go through any, any book in the Old Testament, some of them have some confusing parts, right? And you're, you kind of get a little lost. Some of that history can, can lose you. And there's probably lots of phrases and words that you don't understand. They're hard to decipher. There's passages like that in scripture, obviously. So what do I mean when I say the Bible is clear? Well, that means the doctrine of the clarity of scripture, when we say that, it's not a blanket statement that means every single verse in the Bible is clear. That's not what we mean. And we don't mean that it's obvious to everybody either. It's like, oh, when you read that, oh, it's obvious. Rather, what we mean is the Bible, when read, by an ordinary person through ordinary means can accurately understand enough of what is important to be a Christian, to be faithful. You don't need somebody else to tell you how to interpret the message of salvation. It is clear enough for you to read this that you don't need some authority figure or some teacher to tell you what you're reading. The Bible is clear. The things you need to know and believe can be clearly seen in the Bible. Listen to what Moses said. Moses says in Deuteronomy, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. The good news is the Bible is a single story and it's taught with a single voice. So anytime it's not clear in one section, just go look at another. When you approach any subject in the Bible, you can always ask, what is the theme? What were God's intentions? As we, as we study the Bible and as we compare, hopefully we all arrive at the same conclusion. Bible is sufficient. 
The Bible, the Bible is clear, and the Bible has authority. Authority. It, it is authoritative. The last word always goes to God. You must never allow the teachings of, script, of, of people, of science, a pastor, a church, a denomination to take precedence over Scripture. Remember, it's sola scriptura, by Scripture alone. Second Peter 1 says, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does Peter say? He says, Nothing in this book came from a human author. So, if it's all God's word, then it has to be the authority. Not to mention that Jesus trusted the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say, I, I trust what Jesus said, I'm just not so sure about the rest of the Bible. <laughs> okay, but Jesus trusted the Bible. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Look at what Jesus just said. He says, this, meaning the word of God, is going to last until the end of time. It, it, it's going to go on and accomplish everything that it's supposed to accomplish in the world. In John 10, 35, Jesus says, scripture cannot be broken. So Jesus proclaims the authority of the Bible. When you read how Jesus talked about the Bible with people, he would back up his arguments with Scripture. So if Jesus believed every sentence and every single word of the Scriptures, then so should we. But what's sad is, when I go to churches, I'm still surprised at how few people bother to look in their Bibles when the pastor talks, or, or let alone bring a Bible with them to to, to church. I don't know what it is. Laziness, forgetfulness, or if it's something else, but it's not a good habit. Listen, as a pastor, I have no authority in myself, and I don't want people to just take my word for it. God's church should be testing everything against God's word. The Bible is also necessary. It's authoritative and it's necessary. In other words, we cannot know God solely by a personal experience or by using my own reason, okay? We need God's word to tell us how to live. And we need God's word to tell us who Jesus was. We need God's word to tell us how to be saved. John 6 says, many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you wanna go away as well? And Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter said, where, where would I go? Why would I want to leave? Your words are necessary. The bottom line is that the word of the world is not like the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2 says, among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. Earthly wisdom is new and it's now, but biblical wisdom is ancient and everlasting. One is fleeting. The Bible says doomed to pass away, while the other is fixed and firmed, decreed before the ages. If you want the wisdom of passing fashion and impressive intellect and talented people, then you can look to the world. But if you want and you feel like you need wisdom that is beyond you, that is outside of us, wisdom that will also never fail you, you must look to the things that God has revealed through his word. The Bible is sufficient, it is clear, it is authoritative, and it is necessary. What a difference these four doctrines of Scripture make in everyday life and in godliness. It means counselors can guide meaningfully because Scripture is sufficient. It means Bible study leaders can lead confidently because Scripture is clear. 
Preachers can teach with boldness because the Bible is authoritative, and evangelists can win souls because the Bible is necessary. So why do people still attack it? Why do people try to discredit it, poke holes in it? Because the answer is the Bible makes a claim on your life. Most books you can read and they're enjoyable. And at the end, the book makes no demand on you. They don't ask you to change your life. The Bible, on the other hand, makes some very big claims. It makes claims about who God is, and it makes claims about how someone finds God. It makes claims on how you would live your life, how you'd spend your money, how you raise your kids, how you run your business, how you be a good spouse, how you make decisions. And most importantly, it makes claims on what you should believe. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but people don't like being told what to do. Therefore, it is in the interest of many people and groups to find reasons to disbelieve the Bible. Because if people can get away with believing that it's not accurate, or that its claims are invalid, or that it's full of scribal errors or contradictions, then that means they don't have to change their behavior and they don't have to give up their old life. But if the Bible, as we have shown it today, is accurate and authoritative, then the question for you is, will you believe the Bible and the claims that it makes on your life? And will you dig into it and read it gain direction from it, and ultimately guidance as it draws you closer to your Creator. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your perfect word. We thank you for this book and for all that it teaches us. May we have a hunger for it. May we draw closer to it all the time, searching its pages for truth, for knowledge, wisdom, Assurances, it is complete and has everything we need to be complete, to be your sons and daughters. Give us a hunger and a passion and a thirst to read these words. And when we read these words, give us the knowledge to understand them and the courage to live them out. We thank you for these words, for the men and women who wrote them and died for them and who preserved them so that one day we could have them. And thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to read them and love them and follow them every day of our life. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching. And if you were here on Easter, of course, we'd love to have you come back. Uh, we have two services every single week on Sundays. We have a 930 service, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. Uh, we take communion. We do responsive readings. We say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's everything that you remember about church when you were growing up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service with a band. Come casual, come as you see fit. Uh, we've got a full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.